Good morning, congregation. It's always a blessing to be here to worship you in spirit and in truth, giving praise and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to thank the young man that came up here and read the text scripture in our hearing. We're going to go and read that again. You know, when Brother Charles spoke with Brother Charles uh, concerning me coming here and preaching on this day, I was supposed to preach a couple weeks ago, but I, I, I went to Hawaii and I was thankful that we were able to make the arrangements for me to be here on this day. Well, I tell you that 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 trip to Hawaii, whew, we ended up hiking about uh, maybe a mile and a half, two miles up to get to uh, the waterfalls to swim in the lake. I said, okay, this, this water doesn't have chlorine in it, so I should be okay. So I got my life vest on and eased my way into the water scared of course <laughs> so i started swimming to the to the waterfalls maybe about 100 meters and by the time i got to the waterfalls my wife my nephews and the basketball teams all having fun and i'm panicking with a life vest on thinking i'm gonna drown <laughs> said oh my god my wife says come on honey you can do it you can do it so i got over there by the rock and the waterfall. So now I'm trying to grab, grab onto the rock so I can, you know, sit down on the rock or something. And I said, wait, wait a minute, I might be able to stand up. <laughs> so then I realized there's no bottom. Oh my God. So I had a panic attack. So I finally got around on the other side. They couldn't see me, but I'm sitting on the, I, I finally make it up, find a little hole in the rock came up, grabbed it, and swung myself around and got out the water. I said, oh, my Lord. And then my nephew, he's over there surrounded by his basketball team. I can't swim. I can't swim. He got a life vest on, too. Now his head's sticking out of the water about that much. I said, I can't breathe now. And then all of a sudden, I say, I can't breathe. So, so I'm sitting on the rock. I say, man, I. I don't know if I can swim back. I'm, I might have to call for help. I was getting ready to raise my hand and say, hey, I can't swim back. <laughs> so I sat on the rock for about 10 minutes. And then finally, I, I swam back to the shore. And a, a young lady seen me coming out of the water. And she said, I didn't even recognize her. And she said, uh, oh, Byron, are you all right? And I just looked at her. And I said, headache. At that point, she knew what was going on with me. You know, I had a, a, a panic attack, and they said I was dehydrated. But after that, the next day, we were supposed to go uh, scuba diving or whatever, snorkeling. I said, no, nah, I, can't, I can't get back in no water. That's it for me. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to. Thank the Lord that we had a, a safe flight there and a, and a safe flight back. Exodus chapter 7, verse 5. God is Jehovah. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. This is a a three-part series. I may not even get a chance to finish the first series looking at the time. I think it's what? About 1050 right now. So, all right. The book of Exodus is a book of pictures. You know, today we have a lot of philosophers teaching their philosophies and we have a lot of false teachers 
as they did in years gone by, so we have it today. See the pictures in the first part of Exodus presents a portrait of life that the that the children of Israel uh, experience under the usurpation of the devil, the power of the devil. By means of these pictures, the nature of such life was exposed. See, the pictures in this book also unveil the desires of God's heart with respect to his chosen people as in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1 afterwards Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh thus says the Lord the God of Israel let my people go that they may hold a feast to my name in the wilderness you see the Lord they substituted that title with the original name of the Lord because they felt that Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, and Jehovah, which in the Old Testament, the J doesn't exist. So the, the J was later on introduced in about the 15th, between the 15th and the 18th, 19th century. You see, so when we see the name Joshua, put a Y there. You see, because in the Hebrew language, there are no vowels. So we have J-H-B-H as the name of Jehovah in our reading you know the name of y-h-w-h is used more than 700 times in the bible that's more than all the title names of the lord and that is more than all the common names of like abraham Isaac and Jacob. You know, even Jesus came as the person of Y H W H, which is Yahweh. You see, God's people had fallen into a worldly life under Satan's usurpation, under Satan's rule as the book of exodus reveals god delivered them from this and brought them into the wilderness and to the mountain where they receive the heavenly vision of the pattern of god's dwelling place on earth that was god's whole purpose and desire to bring the children of israel out from underneath the usurpation of the devil. You see, God did it by his mighty hand. You see, God wanted to tabernacle with his people. You see where Exodus 3 and 14 says that I am that I am. You see, God becomes what is necessary to get his will done, as in the instance when Moses seen him as the burning bush. You see, God manifested himself. He became to Moses in the burning bush. You see, this was the desire of his heart. In order to expose the real situation in life under the Pharaoh's uh, power, the book of Exodus described 12 conflicts between Jehovah and Pharaoh. You see what, what God did in the first 
meeting with Pharaoh. It's a negotiation. God is negotiating with Pharaoh to get him to understand that you are just a man. And you're going to find out that I am who I am. You see, in the first conflict, there were no miracles. God demanded that Pharaoh let his people go into the wilderness three days journey to hold a feast unto him. I wanted to read the entire chapter of Exodus chapter 7. It's verses 1 through 25. But time wouldn't allow us to go that route. But anyhow, when we deal with the Lord, the Lord is all about having a feast with us, experiencing him in an eternal way, as in how the 70 went up with Moses to the mount. We read that in Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 through 12. I think my mic just went out. Batteries. This one? Okay. There we go. Guess I got to bring this guy back over. Okay. Exodus 24, verses 9 through 12. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of, Israel, 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet as it were a pavement of sapphire, stone, like the very heaven from clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief man of the people of Israel. They, they beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the uh, tablets of stone with the law and the commandments, which I have written for your instructions. But at the time that they went up, they ate and drank with the Lord. Now, when you think about that, you know, the Lord says, I can prepare a table in the wilderness before your enemies. God is able to do that. There is nothing uh, impossible or too hard for the Lord to accomplish, you see. But Pharaoh refused to acknowledge Jehovah or to hearken to his demand. See, and the second conflict, which we will be talking about at, at a later date, uh, if it be the Lord's will, there was a miracle, but no plague. There was exposure, but no judgment. You see, and when Pharaoh, in Exodus chapter 7, in verse 9, when Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle. Then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So when you see that word serpent, you must understand that it's really a reptile that we are, we are talking about. So at the time when this had taken place, Pharaoh calls his magicians to do the same. 
So what happens? What happens is that Aaron's rod swallowed up Pharaoh's magician's trickery. We see and say, well, how was they able to do what they did, the magicians, with their rod? See, when we look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, we get a chance to understand that the coming of the lawless one is by the, the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. You see, Satan never went away just because when you read the scriptures, you don't see his name, but you can see his activity. And in this instance, by the, the uh, secret arts of the magicians of Egypt, this is what they were influenced with by the deceptive work and the activity of the devil. So what was the purpose of this miracle? The purpose of this miracle was to expose the actual situation of life in the world. You see, people put so much trust into the world, the system of the world, which is under the control of the devil, present day usurpation, that they forget all about the life of God. You see, one thing we must understand when we're dealing with God's word is that God's word is life. Remember in uh, chapter three of Genesis, don't eat from this tree. You eat from this tree, this is gonna happen. So he put two trees before them. We as Christians living on the tree of life, those who are outside of the body of Christ are living by what? Good and evil and the knowledge of truth. You must be able to separate that. You have to be able to separate life from the knowledge of evil, good, and all of that. We have to be able to separate that and see God's word is life. So when we teach and preach God's word, it must not be from a knowledge of the tree of evil, good and evil. It must be coming from the life of God. We must come and use and exercise our abilities and pray that God will give us the understanding to be able to deal with this. After the first two conflicts, the plagues begin to come upon Pharaoh and his people. God never does anything without warning the people. We read that in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, I think it is. So, God does not all of a sudden just inflict pestilence or the sword or anything of that nature. As he dealt with Moses and he spoke to Moses and said, hey, go and tell the people this. Go and tell Pharaoh that before I unleash the wrath on them. Well, it's the same way with us today. God warns us and tells us. We may be going through things in life. We have to pray and ask God for strength that we may overcome these things that we are going through. So, in Exodus chapter 11 and verse 5 is where God deals with the last plague uh, with, with Pharaoh. And every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle. You see, when we look back at all the pictures in the Old Testament, it points to Christ and what it is today. When you are baptized into Christ, you are covered by that blood. So when the Lord looks at me, he does not see me, he sees the blood. Just like on the night when uh, the children of Israel 
had to do what Moses told them with the baby lamb, unleavened bread, being ready to go at an instant, paint the latile in the post red so that the angel of death would not come and hit you. And that's what they did. But everyone didn't do that because everybody don't believe in the word of God. So it is with today how we are covered and purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, who came in the person of YHWH, Yahweh. You see, these 10 plagues that God used, there's two things that represent, two things or tens in this instance where God uses with the children of Israel. The first 10 are the 10 plagues, which it took all 10 of them to get Pharaoh to see that you shall know the Lord. You see, in the second 10 are the 10 commandments that the Lord gave to Moses to deliver to the children of Israel. Number 10 is very significant when it comes to the Lord. In Revelations chapter 6 and verse 1, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. In many respects, the seven plagues in Revelation are similar to the ten plagues in Exodus. We must understand that. You see, by means of the 10 plagues, God was able to accomplish the exodus of his chosen people from Israel, from Egypt. During the great tribulation, the seven plagues will enable God's people to make their exodus from the world. You see how that works? You see the Old Testament and how God dealt with his people? Today, we would say that uh, those outside of the body of Christ are in the world. And those who have been baptized into Christ are in Christ, you see. So when the time of a Jesus coming back, those who have been faithful unto death will be taken with the Lord, while those who are in the world don't even have to judge you because you are not even in Christ. It's you're done for all eternity, you see. So at the end of this age, most of God's people will still be in Egypt. That is in the world. OK, that's what we must understand. You see, in the time of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, there was no need for an exodus. There was no need for an exodus. Therefore, they will be taken up before the tribulation. And now, the majority of Christians, however, will need uh, an exodus. The majority of Christians will need an exodus because many are called, but few chosen see by the seven last plagues God will bring his people out of the world there will be no second chance at life you see in Romans 10 and 17 Paul says by way of the Holy Spirit faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. So your faith comes from hearing the word of God. And Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 tells us that we need to repent and be baptized. That's what Peter told those who murdered the Lord when he preached that first sermon told him told them that they had killed Jesus and they said well man and brethren what must we do Peter said repent and be baptized 
that the Lord may send the promise of the Holy Spirit because the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and for those who are far off. You see, we read that also in uh, Ephesians, how that by the blood of Christ, we are brought near to him. Chapter 2. We also must understand that we need to repent. In Luke chapter 13 and verses 3 and 6, repent or perish. That means that you must have a change of heart and receive the gospel. Jesus Christ. And also in Mark chapter 16 verses 15 and 16, Jesus tells his disciples go into all the world and baptize everyone, baptize every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. I want to thank our Heavenly Father today for giving me this opportunity to come here share with this congregation my our brothers and sisters in Christ pray that God continue to strengthen us and guide us in the way of eternity thank you